packing up and moving, no scouting, just shooting, you know, huge credit to the DP, huge credit to the whole crew of just like winging it like a documentary is. Okay. Let's go ahead of the, let's go ahead of the bikers by half hour, send one car ahead. They find a spot they think is great. And we all get a shot as we go by, you know, that kind of stuff. Now. And then we would say, Hey, can we turn around and do that entrance again and have everybody ride into this, you know, lunch place. This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Adam Schomer. How you doing, Adam? Great. Nice to be here, Alex. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. I, I truly appreciate it. I, like I was telling you earlier, I feel like I know you because you yeah. have been one of the, the stars in two of your projects that I've watched. And I, I feel like I already know you just from watching hours and hours and hours of you. <laughs> I love that. I, I love that you've watched it, number one. That's awesome. And and uh, yeah, you, get, you have a little insight into a really powerful, crazy journey, a couple that I've been on. So that's cool that, you know, I've got to share that with you without, you know, being there in person. So yeah, exactly. Fun. Exactly. So, all right. So first and foremost, brother, why did you want to get into this insanity? That is the film industry. <laughs> Great. Never did, you know, didn't have the aspirations <laughs> as a kid. Never, never. Yeah. Maybe like, you know, Billy shoots my neighbor used to make videos with his Guinea pigs, like stop motion, weird, like Guinea pigs saving the day. I want to, I want to see those movies, by the way. I want to see those. <laughs> I kind of do too. I remember like he would make a theater and like show these things. Like, wow. Uh, so back then I, I think I wanted to do that. Uh, but no, no real aspirations. And then um, kind of fell into it in my late twenties where I was bored at a corporate job and decided to do stand up comedy just, and uh, it was the craziest kind of most nerve wracking thing. Mm -hmm. And then that pivoted into improv comedy, which I found to be the yoga of comedy. And mm -hmm. that's that. And I stuck with that. And I said, this is really cool because not only is it fun and I'm meeting people, uh, but it's it's got those yoga principles, right? Release, be with the moment. Uh, yes. And but like athletics. And I've been a uh, semi-pro soccer player. So it was kind of my next athletic venture. Mm -hmm. And that led me into writing and all that kind of stuff. So I was writing more and writing comedy. And eventually that, you know, I won't go long, but eventually that brought me to LA. And I just kept wanting to push it, you know, just go to the next level. Okay. Write screenplays, be in a film, uh, get my set guard, you know, improv. And I was always producing my own stuff when it came to improv as well. Cause you know, no one's just going to, hand you stage time mm -hmm. even in detroit where i where i grew up it was a cool community everyone was very nice and it was a good community but you still had to kind of create your own a, a bit opportunities to be on stage so i think that producerness started there and then once to la um it pivoted um I, I think when I, I won't talk too much, but once I went to India, then I came back and um, and decided, you know, what, I'm going to focus on the writing and producing, because, as you know, acting is a pretty <laughs> tough, tough world, you know, even tougher than I would say, even like producing, writing, directing. I mean, acting is really, acting really is, acting is a, in my opinion, acting is probably the the hardest part of our business with writers right next next door. And then the directors come in after that. <laughs> But actors is like 30, 30 rejections a day. Yeah, exactly. Writers is, a, you know, maybe 20 rejections a month. <laughs> yeah. Directors. Yeah, and, 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 and that powerlessness of not like really being able to create your own stuff. Correct. So I was like, okay, that's not going to work for me. And I was already producing my own, like, you know, little webisodes and a kid's show. And and then a non, you know, who you've seen, a non and had on your other show, uh, when I was in India, my third time there, I said, hey, do you want to do this motorcycle ride into the Himalayas over the highest road in the world? And I'm like, this guy is going to kill me. You know, that in my... I, I can know, see it in like, your face. By the way, I can oh. see it in your face in the doc. You're just like, I just, you were terrified. So, all right, so let's yeah. give everyone a little bit of context. So yeah. you're, this was your first movie, right? Is this your first doc? Yeah, first, first doc and first feature. Yeah. yeah. So it's called The Highest Pass. And it's about, tell everybody what it's about. Yeah, I mean, in essence, it's about... Um, it's, it's facing death, right? Uh, facing death and finding freedom. So facing our fears and finding love, not that we have to get over fear per se, but just be able to move through it. And then the context is a, a journey over the highest road in the world, 18,000 feet on motorcycles, 
my teacher or my guru has a prophecy he'll die in his late 20s. He's that age. It says he'll die in, in an accident in his Vedic chart. And he asks one of his students, me, if he, I want to go. And I've never ridden a motorcycle. And I say, yes, of course, it's my guru and the Himalayas. And you just do it. So I willed myself to say yes at that moment. I remember like making my lips move while in the background, my head is thinking he's trying to kill me to, you know, take on his prophecy. I'm the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> You know, the writer's brain, (laughs) the writer's brain is a horrible thing to have. Oh, it's horrible. It is. Right. You know, you you just can keep every bad story. And I'm like, wow, I could write a lot of movies about this because it's so evil. (laughs) Uh, So then uh, then I went we went out and I was like, yeah, let's make let's invite other people and let's make a documentary. And and to be honest, only wanted to do it if we could do it well, not not. Not that a handy cam or shooting on the iPhone is not well, but it, it's the Himalayas and oh, it's no. India. And I really wanted great cinematography. And um, so we, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to do it if we raise money. We're going to raise money for it. And so I went out and raised money and found a great DP that had experience with motorcycles. And back then it was like the Canon 5D mm-hmm. uh, was like the thing. And, and uh, it served us really well on that trip. I mean, to have like a DP sometimes one time like riding a bike with one hand and and filming with the other at one point we can get into that later but i was that was blew my mind so so i i was able to i saw that movie and i saw the series that you did afterwards about it which we'll talk about in a minute but what i found fascinating about the movie is you know i've uh, you know, many people on the show know that I have another show called Next Level Soul, which is all about spirituality and asking the big questions about life, personal growth, health, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I've had the pleasure of talking to Anand, uh, your guru, on that. And it was just got released this, I think it was this week or last week. I forgot. No, it was this week. I think I released yeah, it. It just came out. Yeah. It just came out this week. And it is fascinating to talk to someone who, you know, in, in many ways is a spiritual master and having a conversation with him and talking to him about life and about your spiritual journey and about just everything was really beautiful and eye opening. And I, I'll put a link to the, in the show notes for that, for that episode. But then I reached out to you. I'm like, well, I got to have Adam on the show because, you know, he's a filmmaker and he's been, and, he, and you're not only just like, ah, I shot a little documentary. You've been doing it consistently over for over a decade now yeah, and yeah. doing it at a high level. You're doing really great work and, and you're doing award-winning work and, and, and movies that many of us have seen and heard of and been on Netflix and so on and so forth. So going back to the highest pass, yeah, the insanity of the environment as a producer, because you didn't direct that one. So you produced that one. Yeah, How, I mean, co-directed. Co-directed. Co- co-directed, although credit-wise, it's not listed. So that's a whole story. Wrote it, wrote it, co-directed, <laughs> co-produced. You I know, figured, first, I figured, first film. I figured, yeah. I, figured, I figured there was a story behind that because like he's directed everything since. What, yeah. what happened here? <laughs> but it's... it was. I got strong-armed in post-production. You know, it Of was course like, you did. It of course you did. Ridiculous. I couldn't no, believe it. No, of course it. you did. Oh, of course couldn't you did. Because we're what we're making a movie about spirituality and, and, the, and the quest for enlightenment. And yet my ego says I must have full credit. So um <laughs> correct. I got kicked it's, out of the office for three weeks once, you know, like I don't know. Yeah, it's exactly exactly. So that's that's a, a great fun, Hollywood fun. great Hollywood story for filmmakers and to understand that that uh, look, it happens, <laughs> it happened to me when we first started. It it, it, it happens to it's yeah. amazing the egos that are in this business. It's fascinating. I, and, I, and I remember, you know, I, I was consulting with Anand in terms of like, how do I deal with this? I'm at, this is a spiritual movie. I'm in post. And like, this is crazy. He's like, look, you have to look at the good parts of someone. They, they had the intent. They saw that, you know, we should produce this thing. This is a great thing. You know, they had that enough there, but not everybody's perfect. So on some level, you're dealing with a five-year-old. You really are. And like, you have to approach it that way. And would you try to explain yourself to a five-year-old? No, you just kind of maneuver in some ways around the five-year-old. And then, you know, that's it. It basically, it just keep it simple. And like in the film, he's like that. Just keep it simple. You're dealing with a five-year-old and move on and do what you can and make the movie. Okay. Yeah, it's, that's a fascinating way to approach it because I believe me, I've, I've dealt with many five-year-olds in this business. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> many, yeah. many, many of them over the years. Um, so, how did you so how did you shoot in that intense environment man like it's it's insane it's insane and for a first first film right. Right, to be we were 21 people total meeting the seven riders plus anon and crew um three you know three cars seven bikes no scouting 
I had never shot in India. We're going over crazy roads. It's um, so how did I deal with, I mean, first part of the environment to deal with is the fact that you might die every day, you know, you know, so that's really when comparing producing and death, it was, death was the main focus, you know, <laughs> like, Oh, I'm in the film, right. I'm writing. Um, first and foremost is like, how about I survive and let's hope everybody else survives. Um, so that, that was the most challenging thing for me was mm-hmm. riding. And then um, pr- producing, to be honest, like I was calling on great people, right? And directing, it was like, okay, I leaned on my DP a lot. You know, when it came to the shot, I, I know what I like, but I'm like, show me what you think would be good here. Awesome. I like it too. Let's move forward. You know, keep it very simple. Lean on your people um, that know what they're doing. I came from a story background, so I knew what I wanted story-wise. And, um, but God, I mean, packing up and moving, no scouting, just shooting, you know, huge credit to the DP, huge credit to the whole crew of just like winging it like a documentary is. Okay. Let's go ahead of the, let's go ahead of the bikers by half hour, send one car ahead. They find a spot they think is great. And we all get a shot as we go by, you know, that kind of stuff. Now and then we would say, Hey, can we turn around and do that entrance again and have everybody ride into this, you know, lunch place. Mm -hmm. But for the most, most part, you get what you get. And I mean, it was 21 days. Jesus, and it was scary as hell. And, we, and you know, sleep was at a total minimum. I remember the first, because in the first few days, you're in the flat, you're in the hills, and then you come to where you see the Himalayas. And this is right. Rotang Pass, the first pass, right? And it's called Pile of Dead Bodies is what Rotang is translated as. So again, the, the story, the, the writer's mind is like, what? And so... You know, you, you doing research on the internet is not helpful because mm-hmm. you pile of dead bodies and you're thinking I'm going right off the cliff and that's that. And but and, and before that, I remember like, oh my God, like what fight with my co-producer. We leave at 5 a.m. So I slept probably two hours before we're about to go into the Himalayas. And it's again, it's just like, okay, so be it. All right. Grab some chai, Alex, and uh <laughs> some coffee and put on your your masks and, and your gloves because it's freezing and and off we go. And uh, and as you see in the movie, that, that whole moment was tough because we made a decision where the roads really weren't quite open yet before right. we even started into the Himalayas at that point. So it was it was scary. Yeah, you, you guys were going on uh, basically basically at, at, the, at the seat of your pants, you know, literally yeah. and figuratively um, yeah. because you were just shooting. So I, I was watching as I was watching this, I'm like, this is insane. This is an insane kind of doc to be or it's an insane movie. And I see what they're going through. I've been at 12,000 feet, I think, oh. at one point in somewhere really? in, Colo- in Colorado. And it was in the summer, so it wasn't freezing. It was still probably like 60 when it was night, like 100 down down, down at the bottom. But – and I've been to, to uh, Park City a whole bunch. And so mm-hmm. I understand that the, the oxygen dep- deprivation, but I'm, I can't even comprehend traveling at eight, up to 18,000 feet. And, and one of our crew went down. Like, we had to send him home. Yeah, no, yeah. Was, it, it'll hurt. That, it'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, that, that was one of the – you know – my audio engineer, he, he helped get it produced. Good friend from Michigan. And he, um, <laughs> it was great because he was telling me what audio equipment he needed, you know, and stuff. So I'm trying to source it in India and I could not find an eight channel mixer anywhere except Mumbai. And then maybe my second DP would bring it from, and then I call him, I'm like, do you really need eight channel? He's like, Oh no. He's like, I just, he had never actually been in the field. He told me later, he was just going by the seat of his pants because he was more sound mix in the back, you know, in the, in the studio. So here I am searching for equipment that he was kind of like, yeah, that's industry standard. I'm like, I couldn't find it anywhere in India. So we, we compromised of course, but he he ended up coming a little, a few days late. So I had a second audio engineer from India and, and that kid begged to come on the trip with us after seeing like the prep. He's like, can I just, help in any way like let me be with anon let me be with you guys this is a trip of a lifetime so we brought him it's a good thing we did because andy my audio engineer um when we were up at the sixteen thousand foot pass and we did this part of the film where we went up and checked the pass out talked to the generals and the generals said no it's closed for two weeks right <laughs> um they're like this pass is closed or snow and if you watch the film you'll see we end up like carrying bikes over snow and it's crazy but during that little pre pre meeting, Andy, our, my sound engineer, went down hard with uh, altitude sickness, and we had to send him home the next day. And so, 
thankfully we had the second audio engineer backup. Audio guy. Yeah. Backup guy. And I uh, did his best. And that's kind of the craziness of, of filming. Like we got lucky, you know, and, and Andy got lucky that he wasn't hurt per se, but you never know who's going to have audio. It doesn't, uh, altitude sickness. You could be in great shape, and uh, oh yeah, it doesn't matter what shape you're in. It, it, it it'll, it'll it'll bring anybody to their knees. If it's it's just a weird. Yeah. weird we all had thing. it at some. Po- we all had it at some point. And then when you get down to like eleven thousand feet, you're like, oh my god, this is amazing. I can breathe, <laughs> you know, and take a moment. Uh, compared because sleeping at fifteen, when you haven't acclimatized, <laughs> it's hard. It's really difficult. It just uh, if you haven't acclimatized, you know. Wow, that's insane. So that with, so with that film, uh, you released it. You went theatrical with that as well, right? We did. Yeah, we were lucky enough to win some awards at festivals and uh, distribution company uh, said, let's take it theatrical. We took it theatrical here in L.A. and went on to Netflix right after that. Awesome. Back when Netflix was a little different. Yeah. A little, it was a little it was a little starting little, little startup uh, yeah. <laughs> back yeah. then. Now, yeah. did you did you get any um, that was your first experience with distribution? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, just sign the distributor and see what happens. And what and what happened? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, thankfully, the theatrical was good, meaning we had a run here in, in Santa okay. Monica and in uh, in L.A. And people saw it and we got a write up in the L.A. Times, like a full page write up, which hasn't happened since on any film I've done. Like we found a reporter that somehow was into it, uh, Suzanne Carpenter, and got what would be like a forty thousand dollar ad kind of. Wow. So there were, you know, in, in essence, because it was just like a full page, huge photo and great article. So people came out and saw it. And a lot of people actually from that then go, went on the road to Dharma. They saw the film, saw us in a Q&A and said, if you do this again, tell us. And so we did. And, when, and that's when we filmed the Road to Dharma series. And a lot of those people from seeing that film then came into the, the next series. And we can talk about that later. But it did it did well in the theater and it got on Netflix and all that. You know, I mean, financially for the investors, no, not so much. But uh, and the, you know, the distributors did their thing where they come up with expenses and all that stuff. No, shocking. Yeah. stop it. So I learned a little bit, Alex. <laughs> and, uh, I just, I, I always like it, asking, I always like asking these questions because I, I can never stop reiterating this fact is that this Hollywood accounting is always Hollywood. Okay. It's just the way they do business. It's just the way the industry has done business. And it's in many ways, I don't even think people who who do it, these distributors who do it, think they're bad guys. I think they just, it's just inherent in the system, the way the system is built. They're just like, yeah, we're going to give you an MG maybe. Back then you right. might've gotten an MG. So you got an, no, we didn't. Not, not even MG, right? So you, yeah, yeah. But then the, oh, you made 10,000 this month. Right. But we had eleven thousand in, in, in expenses. Exactly. What are those expenses? I can't tell you. So uh, <laughs> those kind of things. So I was curious about how if if that was your case as well. Now it, this- it was. They they weren't. You know, cinema Libre, They weren't like horrible by any means. But right. I was, okay, you know, they were still cool. And they, you know, to even believe it again, it's like the good part where they believed in it and they took it theatrical. You go, okay, man. As the first film, like you, you celebrate your wins and then you you take the take the learning on the shoulder and go, okay, that's fine. And so then the second, the, the series Road to Dharma, which just got released in when, 20, yeah. 2020, 2020, 2020, got released, uh, but you shot it in when? We did shoot, we shot it in 2012, to be honest, yeah. So you shot it, to, so it took eight years for that to come out. Yeah. And <laughs> that was because you couldn't find financing or couldn't get the thing, you know. Funded, yeah, basically. Fi- fi- financing, basically. Yeah, because yeah. you, you shot you got it. The scoop. I don't usually tell anyone your podcast has the scoop on that. We have the scoop. I appreciate that. I don't <laughs> think it's going to hurt. And I don't think anyone cares outside right. of people like you and me. No one, right. no one watching it like, oh, this has been shot eight years ago. I can't watch right. this. No, you, no. you can't tell. I don't you care. Can't. You're in the Himalayas with bikes that look like they're from the 50s anyway. So <laughs> everyone's jacked up with all sorts of motorcycle gear. No one can tell. And you're going into towns that don't have any technology anyway. So you have no yeah. idea if it's 2012 or 2020, no, honestly. That's, that's for sure. And it's shot well enough where you're like, you're, you're in there and you have yeah. a feeling of like you're part of the journey. That's a good thing. There's an authenticness of like, you're in it with us. It's good like that. Exactly. So you shot the, 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 the series. I wanted to ask you, cause you said you released it recently and I think it might've been for the best, honestly. Yeah, uh, I, think so too. I think if you would have released it in 2012, 2013, 2014, there wasn't as big of a market for doc series as there is now. So I wanted to hear your experience uh, as a documentarian. Yeah. Do you see more doc series being more valuable in the marketplace or a doc by itself? 
That's a great, I mean, we all see more doc series in general, more docs in general. And I think the other part of the market that is like, like your podcast, spirituality has grown, right? So oh, huge. There, there is, there's more of a market for people that might be on the edge. You know, the, the average guy that maybe comes across and say, or the wife says, Hey, watch this. And, um, cause you know, women tend to be 80% of the yogi community, so to speak. And so they can sometimes bring guys into enlightenment. I don't know about you. I look fantastic in yoga pants, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> it should say Lululemon. It should say. Yeah. I, should, I have I have Lululemons on right now, sir. That's uh, right. <laughs> Absolutely. The socks. Just the socks. Just, just the socks. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, uh, the Spanx. Just the Spanx. Just the Spanx. <laughs> you know. You know, it's on video too, what we're doing here. Yeah. Uh, so I think more valuable, I, I know me personally, I found more value in wanting to tell more of the story, more of people's stories, yeah. more of the wisdom of what goes on there, we're going to more depth. And, you know, there's a certain pacing with a feature doc, feature length doc that you have to keep up. And uh, that's great and all. I can't say, let's say, you know, for, for the filmmakers out there, making an independent series, if there's more value, meaning like it's, easier to sell that or make money on. I think that it's incredibly hard what what I've done. And your last guest was talking about it too, that she did a uh, independent series, not a doc series, but a, a narrative series. And I think it's a strange way to go. Not many people do it and then to sell afterwards. Um, but I think inherently on a meaning level, it's incredibly valuable. I'm still waiting for some of the big boys to kind of come along and say, Hey, this is great. Or maybe I have to do a season two and a season three before one of the big boys says, okay, everyone's ready for this now. All right. So, so I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, yeah, it's, it's, hard to say. it's, it is hard to say because I've seen, I've seen people be very successful with doc series. I mean, docs, docs right now are extremely valuable. And yeah. they have been now probably for the last decade and they've been growing in popularity. And I've talked about them heavily in my book about uh, finding niche audiences. And if you make a yeah. doc about a niche audience, whether that <clears throat> is plant-based diet, spirituality, surfing, skateboarding, whatever it is, there's a built-in audience that you can target much easier than a broad spectrum narrative. Mm-hmm. And docs have been getting more and more, but I've been noticing there's been more doc series on Netflix and on Hulu and on these other places where they will do a series because inherently there's just more value. There's more content for them to, to read. So uh, that's yeah. when I saw, wrote the Dharma. I'm like, well, that makes all the sense in the world. I'm like, cause that's a story you could easily tell in a series. You have more than enough content story to fill yes. that. I, I, that's why when I, I saw the, the, and I was lucky, I saw Rota Dharma first, then I went back and, and saw the highest pass and I was like, oh, okay. So, I, they went, they shot that. And then they obviously went, uh, you know, 10 years later, I said, why did they wait so long um, <laughs> to, go, <laughs> to release the series? But I enjoyed the series much more because you get, I mean, you're, you're taking the motorcycle trip up to the Himalayas with a yogi. I yeah. mean, that's more than 90 minutes, man. I mean, there's, you get, I agree. <laughs> there's just I agree. so, you, you, so I, much. You, so much to see, so much to under the history, even though we don't go too much into the history, but the teachings, you have all these characters, right? Yeah. Everyone That's fighting the- their own demons and trying to find yes. their egos. And they're all, they're all trying to tell themselves stories of why they shouldn't do this. And I thought there'd be more yoga on this retreat and all this kind of, all this right. kind of, all right. this kind of like all- yoga is stretching. And I was like, yoga is not stretching. <laughs> you know, if you want stretching and a massage, go to a spa, you know, he's like, right. get out of here. You come here to transcend. And that's what you come for. And it's like, sweet. You know, that's a good, it's to remind people yoga is not the studio thing. You know? No, it's not. It's, it's the, it's one of the, benefits of yoga is is the physical but it's Mm -hmm. yoga was never built as you know yogis weren't running around in the lululemon you know back in the day you know they were they were it was a it's a a form of transcending spiritually uh Mm -hmm. and i just love him he's like i'm here to challenge you at every step of the way i was like oh this is great so you've got built-in conflict you've got built-in conflict which is so wonderful but you're able to build out this whole story and then how did that go how did how did selling that uh the, the series go yeah, I mean, it is a long journey, right? Since we built it, filmed it in 2012 and raised enough money to to go shoot it on a you know on a shoestring, so to speak, and um, was hoping that when I came back, I'd be able to put a sizzle together and go out to some of these networks and say, "Hey, look, I have the footage already of it here. You don't even have to buy into the idea. I already shot it." So this mm-hmm. was my my thinking was no problem, right? I'll go shoot it, come back, and they'll have no choice but to be like, "Oh, of course, we'll give you the money to finish it." But, that didn't work. Uh, so I couldn't get anyone to, to bite on that. And then 
year after year goes and I start, I, w- I was making heel. I, I got brought in to produce heel. Mm-hmm. And while I was producing heel, um, we had like a couple week break on something. I decided, I said, you know what, I'm going to go brush up and learn premiere full on and did so on my vacation and then started editing the first two episodes, episode one and two of the road to Dharma. While I think that yeah, the whole end of post and distribution, which is a crazy time for a documentary film, I was also editing two episodes. So I was really pushing myself uh, to make sure Rhoda Dharma was ready when Heal was done. Um, so that you know, that's a lesson to people. Sometimes you gotta work your your ass off on the side, right, to be ready. And so when, and I think to be honest, I mean, I'm really glad that. I had some time as a filmmaker to grow in between and, and be able to like show my vision a, a bit better and, and to make those first two episodes and be able to show somebody, this is what I'm talking about. You know, this is the style. I want to be able to mix it being entertaining and character driven, but also have that spirit there. And I'm not putting a nod on a pedestal as his guru. I'm trying to make him approachable. And if, if you resonate with what he says, great, but this isn't a movie of a series about a guru and how to follow him. No, it's about people seeking freedom and our demons, like you said. So I really wanted to get that across. And maybe that was holding back, you know, holding some back, us back with some of the networks is like, uh, you know, we can't go that spiritual yet. But it's yeah, not, right. you know, it's it's still like a, re, a reality, an authentic reality show in many ways. Like, so uh, there's danger. So then, um, yeah, an invest. I showed an investor uh, a couple episodes and. And actually, it was more like a friend that I didn't know had the ability to invest. <laughs> and, he, and he pulled me aside and was like, I want to talk to you about the road to Dharma. I want to invest. You're like, when does that happen? And all the time. It happens all yeah, the time. Adam. All the all time. The, all the time. Money is easy to get in the business. Don't you know that? Right, right, right. <laughs> It create no. It happened on the highest pass at one point too, because we were all the way through post, and we know we needed a second uh, cut. And I was at an event, and uh, it was a Cornell like event. I went to Cornell University, and one of them, one of my buddies says, "Hey, I'm looking to invest in films." <laughs> Which, which right. in, in normal scenarios, you would go, you don't, you don't want to do that, man. Don't no, do, no. And he's like, I do. just want to learn. I, I just want to learn a little okay, bit. Okay, good. See if I, you know, good. I'm, oh, perfect. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm at a great place, less risk because it's already kind of done. And, and you can see. And so he threw in some money, you know, and I, that was okay. the universe giving a little nudges. So it, it's, it's helped out on the way in its own timing to use some woo-woo language. But uh, and so we yeah, we got an investor there and then I got another investor. We were able to, you know, finish the, the series on our own and and take it out on our own digitally and still be able to keep pitching it to networks. We still do to this day, keep keep pitching it internationally to different places. Like we're signing with a network in Germany, signing with a signing with a network in Brazil, talking to a network in France. We're on Gaia as well. And um and then I had I had to get a little creative and I even court, create a course around the around Yeah, the I saw that. I saw the course on uh, Anand's website. So that was a really interesting you see, it's like it's like you read my book. It's exactly what I say. It's like you create the product and then create other ancillary products that generate more revenue than the movie yeah. ex- exhibition of the movie is. Because the future of the of the future of our business is not 2299 rentals. It's right. courses, it's workshops, it's other businesses as other services wrapped around yeah. things that can serve that audience, that, that niche audience. So for you, it'd be the spiritual audience. And, and, and also I knew from, um, I knew from heel that things like, like an online summit or an online course, you can, you can access other people's audiences for those things more than you can a film. So I could say to heel, I could say to Greg Braden, people I knew well and say, you can be an affiliate of this course. You can make 50% revenue if you promote it to your, your people. And, you know, there's something free. They get to watch the free, free episodes and it's something you believe in, you know, and we know each other. So then, okay, now you're getting someone personally blasting and now you're reaching 500,000 people or a million people personally with a course. And even if they don't bite the course, they might try the free episodes or they might then go find the series and you got some advertising and every it's a win-win they make money your list grows too and um anyway so that's that's another thing you can't do as easily with just a film yeah and so which brings me into the next movie heal which i 
I saw Heal before I saw Road to Dharma or The Highest Pass. So I'd, I'd watched Heal just purely because I was interested in the concept of the movie, mm-hmm. the doc, and it was down my wheelhouse. I was like, oh, let me watch it. So I watched it. I really enjoyed the film. I knew a lot of the people inside uh, inside the film, like, you know, the, the people you, that, that are you interview like and Braden, stuff. Chopra, yeah, yeah, all those guys. I and mean, yeah, we, I, I, you, I just known all of them and I've read their books and things like that. But Heel was, I remember Heel being, I met one of the other producers at a summit once. I forgot the name of the producer, but one of the other producers I met and he was just at the brink of the Netflix deal. And I just remember that I was like, this is actually doing, it's doing, it's getting a lot of attention. The doc got a lot of attention. So yes. tell me the story of Heel and mm-hmm. what, the, what the movie is about generally, but then how you were, because it kind of almost hit, it almost kind of was the, fork over knives mm-hmm. of that of that movement if you're anyone who doesn't know what fork over knives is is what it was basically the i think the first documentary that really talked about uh plant-based diets and it yeah. exploded and built multi-million dollar businesses yeah. around it i think a magazine even they have oh magazine thing. food products i mean it's it's built it, they've done fantastic off of that doc and heal i feel is that for its niche in in the space so can you talk a little bit about what it is yeah, and thank you for watching it, and thank you for speaking so highly of it. Uh, so, uh, where do we want to start? I mean, heal in general. What it is is a film about really that the, we have the power within to heal, and that um, through our emotions, through stress, through our thoughts, that we have a, a bigger part to play in our healing than just giving our power away necessarily to medicine or to a doctor um, or to any healer, to be honest. So, it ends up being a we hope a very integrative film not super woo -woo saying it's only emotional we're just saying that's part of the puzzle and that it should be talked about and that's what i i like about the film is saying let's open our our perception a bit in terms of healing and realize that thoughts do play a part emotions do play support plays a part your life purpose might play a part you might need to move or change something in your relationships to help your body get out of a stress mode so it can do its thing and help heal your disease and you also might need to change your diet you might need to do chemo and you might need to do some other things right um but it's part of it and we wanted to just dive into that and we use a lot of experts we use a couple stories one of the stories is in a isn't a happy ending and i like that about the film it's 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 chronic illness and it's a damn tough space and she doesn't know what's wrong and she's not really willing to make the changes And the system, as we talk about the film system, not necessarily set up right or distributors just do their thing. Our health system isn't set up exactly correctly (laughs) to support the mind body healing. You know, it's it's not there to help you pay for that stuff. So resources is an issue. You say, oh, why don't you all just change this in your life? Well, I'm just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And so um, that stuff we continually look at and then heal. We realized after the film, there was more we could offer for the audience. So um, the film did amazing. We, uh, you know, if you want to talk strategy a bit in terms of what we did distribution, I can. I can yeah, please, you. please. Uh, Cause it's helpful. And I've used it with some films afterwards when they've come to me and I usually don't consult. It's not like my job, but when something falls into a niche that I've done and I feel I can help them and they're primed for it. And I like the film, it's like, okay, you know, let's do it. So um we realized, of course, we needed an audience like you've talked about before we release. You can't wait <laughs> until you're releasing. So as soon as we started filming, we started building a fan base and with a website and, and getting emails out there and, and attracting people to the film. So by the time we launched, I think we had 50,000 person email list, which isn't huge, but. <laughs> you know what? It's it, not it's not a joke either. That's a huge a email list for a movie that had nothing at the beginning. That's a nothing. that's a that's a fairly massive email list. Yeah. And that's how big this audience is. That tells you Correct. volumes of how big this audience is. Right. Right. It, it, healing in general. You know, people are saying, I don't know about you. Something hurts on me right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my hip is a little my hip, You know, my ankles is hurting because it's about to rain. So there you go. There's always <laughs> someone we're all hurt as you get older. Something hurts. So, hey, who's the audience? Everyone who's in pain <laughs> from people who are, you know, on the brink of death because of a chronic illness to my hip hurts. <laughs> yes. and, it, and it's not like it goes away, you know, like meaning, it, meaning it takes a, a new audience every year. No meaning like, you oh, know, no, yeah, the audience, yeah, the audience doesn't shrink. They don't, it doesn't <laughs> shrink. It's only growing and awareness. And like, we've been out five years, I think. And, you know, 
yeah. still 12 million minutes a month on prime, you know, like people were still in the charts in the UK and Germany when it comes to digital sales. Um, That's people insane. are still because people are looking friends. for it. People are still well, looking yeah. for it. Yeah. One of my good buddies I play soccer was like, Hey, I watched, I finally watched your movie. He, I'm like, thanks for the support, you know, five years later, but he's like, it's great. Uh, so people on their own time come to these things anyway. So distribution wise, back to that 50,000, we built the audience. We knew we needed to do that. Did you self-distribute or did you go through a distributor? We did a hybrid type thing. And, and this is awesome. something, again, by the time I was working with Heal, Kelly, it's Kelly Gores' film. Kelly, Kelly came up with it. She's the director. She brought me in to produce. And I'm very thankful that she did because now we're like co-producing uh, partners and great relationship. And um, so she knew she had done like a horror flick kind of before. And, you know, so she knew the problems in distribution and what a distributor does to you. We both knew that. So that was cool. And so we were going to do anything in our power to not be in their power. Uh, so I knew from the beginning, let's build an audience beforehand so that we could go out, you know, independently and have somebody to support us. We knew it was an organic audience of email. So we knew if people that wanted, they personally said, I want you to have my email, keep me posted. Okay. They'll probably buy, you know, they'll, they'll probably jump in. Um, in terms of all that growing and, you know, we went to a festival that we knew was our audience and we were the opening night there and there were 700 people. And so our investors also got to see that and, and then see, Oh, wow, there's, there's an audience here and it's palpable. And uh, that helped them put a little bit more money for independent distribution. So in terms of strategy, what we did, we decided to do like theatrical on our own and, and screenings on our own. So we brought in a screening guy to, to handle the small screenings and get people talking about it out there and do, you know, that's, what do you call organic press for us? Cause some church in Iowa that's going to do a screening is going to tell their people about it. Okay. A hundred people show up, but you know, a thousand people got heard about it and heard about heal. And maybe it's on their radar next time they see it or hear about, it or someone, you know how it is, right? You have to talk about it, talk about it, talk, but finally you watch the thing. So we did a lot of those screenings, probably a hundred. We did a bunch in Australia definitely made a little money there, but you know, sometimes if you just break even with the screenings and all that, that's great. Definitely made a little money in the screenings, broke even on theatrical. And we came out in I think eight, eight to 10 cities, you know, hired a consultant to help us do that. Um, so I was like the point man brought in the screening guy, brought in the theatrical guy. And then for digital, we signed with, uh, what's called 1091, you know, a distribution company. They, back then they were the orchard. Oh yeah. Um, I know that. Yeah. And now they're 1091 and they've had a lot of success digitally come out with, um, some spiritual films, some alien film, niche films, biking films. So they, they knew, and we had, we, we structured a good deal with them to be honest. And they supported us and gave us a little bit of money for, you know, trailer and all this other stuff that we didn't want to dump a lot into. And um, so we, we also then planned it like Kelly and I, neither of us wanted to do this long protracted distribution cycle of like, let's do screenings for a year, you know, right. like, like the film Awake with Yogananda did. And we're like, we don't want to do that. Yep. It, they were super pa successful at Peter it. And Paula, and yeah. Peter and Paula, well. good for, yeah. Peter and Paula, yeah. Yeah. I met them because of the highest pass way back. Right. Yeah. Well, oh, uh, I would imagine you guys' paths crossed. They've been on the show yeah. and been on my show like three times already. I, I just they, uh, love, yeah. love yeah. them. And I love what they did with that film. It's amazing. I mean, it's, 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 they actually are a case study in my book as well. They, so Peter came, we were, they wanted to see Michael Malura, who's the composer of the highest pass. They wanted to hear his work. So I showed him a cut of the film and they're like, Adam, this is so cool. Like, and then I ended up bringing Peter in to help edit like the second cut. So we became buddies and, uh, and I love his story mind and they're great and, and then i gave them some footage for awake from the highest pass to use in the film which was just like and anand is in awake i don't know if you know that anand I is in. i think he might yeah. i think i might have seen him in awake you're absolutely yeah. right that's I, of yeah. course i saw him in awake yeah 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 so so it becomes a kind of like a small little you know a nice little family and uh i mean just an honor to have some of a footage from one of my films with Yogananda in that film. Anyway, so yeah. back to the heel distribution thing, we decided let's not do the long thing like awake, let's do condense. So we pushed theatrical screenings and digital as close together as possible. Okay. Uh, so we came out in October in theaters uh, and then by December 5th, we're out on digital. And of course we had to do all that, you know, independently when it comes to theatrical and all that so that we could have control of all of our dates. And, and and just want to just stop you for that for a second. So when people listening, the reason why uh, Awake, which is a documentary about the spiritual master Yogananda, 
did their long their long theatrical and screenings was because they had direct co-production or relationship with Yogananda's organization, which basically had access to every Yogananda yeah. disciple around the world. So it would be foolish not to stretch that out as much as you could because it was just a, such a such a built-in audience such a that audience. It, it, they made they, they did very well they, he saw millions and they, they did really yes. really really well so but yeah. for you hard hard to replicate yeah hard very difficult to replicate uh i think uh uh Hare krishna uh harry krishna they they tried to do something similar but didn't great have film. the same great film too i love that film but didn't have the same access to that because they literally just like touch a button and they can talk to everybody. Right. So with heel, from my perspective, looking, listening to what you're saying, mm -hmm. it's an audience, but it is not a dedicated. It's not like people who are just like, you know, religiously about this. It's a much broader diluted audience. So what your tech, your, your strategy makes much, much more sense. Yeah. We built that audience, built the email list and got everyone excited for, okay. It if you can't see it in theaters, not you're you're not in one of the main cities. Don't worry, uh, or you didn't get a small screening in your area. It's coming December fifth on digital and DVD. We even did DVD. And, and what did you do on DVD, by the way? We did. We made like one hundred and fifty grand on DVD. Of course you did, because people. I mean, what year was this? 2017? 2017? 27, the end of seventeen. So call it 2018. 20, 2018, right? Still DVD. I, DVD still sell. People don't listen. It. People still buy DVDs. If you're at a screening and you love the movie and you had a DVD with some bonus stuff in it, somebody would buy it. It's, we could. I mean, I guess we we could believe it, but we couldn't. But you know, a little older audience is a little more has the illness, and they're still with DVD at that point, and it's sold. Correct. Um, right. And that was cool to see that. And and we did really well on digital when we came out. And our goal was. To be honest, 1091, The Orchard had already pissed, pitched Netflix and Netflix had said no to the, to the really? film. Okay. They did. This was in the fall before we came out theatrically and all that. Uh, then we come out theatrically and, and do this big push. We hit number one on iTunes and, in terms of the charts yeah. and stayed there for a few weeks. In, in documentary theater. or in all? In, doc in, documentary, in, doc in documentary. In documentary. Yeah. yeah. I mean, going, you know competing Don't, with everyone else almost impossible but yeah but still doc, number number one doc is no easy feat. hard to do but then to stay there because usually we stayed for a few weeks and then in the in the top three for about three months so we had like the staying power and then we went back to netflix and said you know the distributors like look people like this thing it's making money it's you know you should really reconsider it and then and then they did come up with a two-year deal and uh, nice. it wasn't it wasn't anything great, you know, to be honest. Yeah. But it was it was for us to um, it was more about exposure, of course. For of course, we most of our money was made on just digital sales. You know? Really, so most of the money was done still on, t on transactional. Absolutely. But but this movie, because I always tell people transactional is dead, generally speaking. But but the difference is that your topic, mm -hmm. someone will rent it for three ninety nine. Someone will buy it for nine ninety nine if you have extra bonuses or extra interviews in it because it's such a there's something I'm like I want to heal myself I'm gonna spend three ninety nine it's a horror movie I'll, I'll wait till I find it somewhere else there's a thousand other horror movies but there is no other healing documentary so you have this really special place and that's why and that makes sense for transactional and I'm glad yeah, that you I'm actually motivated. waited. Yeah, I'm glad you actually waited for Netflix. So if you would have gotten that Netflix at first deal, you wouldn't have made as much money. Yeah, I mean, they said no, to be honest, you know, the, it, right? And so my strategy for some other people was like, well, if if you can't turn the dial, show them that you can by trying to get, get yourself to number one on iTunes, right? which is hard in itself, or just show them there's an audience by selling. And who knows, you might not even want to be on Netflix, but or go on Prime or even though Prime's gotten a little crazy with what they let on there with, with docs. Um, right. By yeah. the way, Prime, Prime dropped recently. So after Netflix, we went on to Prime, um, which then is just by minute and they're paying you by minute. Um, and that ended up being very lucrative also. You know, mm -hmm. people are still you would probably it. be at the you would probably be at the higher end of that minute per minute because there's a range of a penny to like 12 cents or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You would probably be higher. Seven, maybe since we were making per, per minute. Yeah, and that's great. At one point, you know, I don't mind sharing this. Stuff. At one point we were making there was like 12 million minutes a month, basically, is what recently. 
<laughs> then Prime and its big, you know, like shove off of, of Doc, Docs. They, right? Um, we, they dropped us in the UK, they dropped us in Canada, dropped us in France. And we're like, geez, you know, like, what's up? Why? You know, what's up? And then suddenly during COVID, they dropped us in the US. And so we had our distributor ask them, he's like, he's like, they don't even tell me why. I've never had them overturn it uh, with all the docs that have, they've taken off of ours. And with Heal, for some reason, like a week, two weeks later, they put it back on. Uh, wow. So something clicked in their head. Like, why why do we randomly take this off? You know, go, oh, it's alternative health and we're in COVID and that's dangerous to uh, who knows why they turned it off. You know, <laughs> there's nothing about COVID in there. Obviously, it was pre-COVID. And, and even so, I think people should be able to talk, you know, it's a little strange out there. That's a whole nother topic, but distribution wise, you know, Netflix, a little, you know, a little chunk, but the awareness with Netflix went crazy. And then we pivoted to prime after, and that's helped a ton and still transactionally, you know, people still buy it transactionally, but he is a, you know, kind of an anomaly. Like we're talking about people are always sick and they're looking for resources and they're motivated. And, uh, and we think it's a very balanced film. It's not too woo. So, so it has a broad audience, which is what we wanted. That's awesome. And then you also like started building out other product lines and services around Heal, which I found fascinating as well. So you had, a, I think a book came out. Uh, you Kelly also have, book, yeah. yeah, Kelly. So she has a book based on it. So now you're leveraging the audience of the people who've seen the movie. They're like, oh, the Heal, the book is out. I'll buy it. Like I yeah. bought the, I bought Awake the book. <laughs> I didn't even know. That's exactly. Great. I I saw the Awake book. It was just like the movie companion of the book. I'm like, I look. I, I, I'm such a fan of that movie. I was like, I bought it. And then Peter was like seeing it in the background of my show. Of my show, he's like, that's that's amazing. I'm like, yeah. Like, so it's great. So you have the book, but then you also did something which was really interesting: the summits. So yeah. can you go? Can you go into the summits a little bit? What is the <laughs> how you were able to partner with a very big self help? publishing company. And if you don't mind talking about the financials of that, not details, but just general. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, it is fascinating. And it's, it's something that jumped out to me as we we're making it where we're like, we have these interviews that are an hour, an hour and a half with these top experts, Chopra, hey. Dispenza, Braden, uh, and, and Anthony William medical medium was very huge now and was just kind of growing at the time. Um, what are we going to do with these interviews? We should do something. And so I was, we were super busy, of course, with the film, but I was whispering to Kelly, like we, we should put these together and sell them in some way or put them for people that want the deep information. So we were considering doing it on our own. And then, um, and I, I, you know, we just thought, well, a lot of these people are Hay House authors. You know, a lot of these, you know, we, let's approach Hay House and see if they want to do something together because they would have an audience too. And that could be helpful. So we just called them up and um, had a meeting, sat there, you know, with the CEO down in San Diego and he's super nice. It's like, this sounds great. Let's do it. You know, it's like, this is, yeah, it's a win-win 50, 50. Cool. Let's put them out there. And, and they had their strategies of like affiliate partners and all that. We had all the footage. They had the marketing team to be able to make it happen and get it out there. They had that system. And that's, you know, we just had to really deliver and support and make sure it was in our brand that they didn't, you know, make it too Hay House, that it still had the heel ethos to it. And that's something we wanted to keep. And it's a great partnership. I mean, we love Hay House. And we end up doing a summit two and a summit three. And I mean, the summits financially did fantastic. So are those, are those based on old interviews that you shot for the movie or did you have new stuff come in? For the, for the first summit, we took all the interviews from the film and... I don't think we added anything new because we had 18 that we filmed. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we did. And so that first summit did amazing. And the, you know, the, the great byproduct that came out summer of 2018 after the film was out, but then we walked away with an email list that was about 300,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so you're talking, you know, you're talking dirty to me now, sir. Talking dirty. No, I mean, I, they were blown away. We were the best. We, we did the best of in their summits that year. They were blown away. We were blown away. Um, financially, I won't go into the details. Sure. They did very, very well. Uh, the summits alone that we've done have more than covered the budget of the film. And that makes you kind of think and you go, oh, my God, you know, like you put all this effort into editing a film and you could have shot 18 interviews and not edited anything and put a summit, but you needed the film to create the buzz and the film really is the entry point. It's 
And here it's, we are though in 2022 and there's a lot more summits and it's a little more saturated now. So like, does that, yeah, it is, it is, work? A, you know. it is a little bit more saturated, but still, if you've got an audience and you've got a topic, people will, it'll cut through all of that. And it's literally exactly what I was writing about in my book, rise of the film entrepreneur. It's like the movie becomes a giant trailer, a giant, yeah. a giant marketing piece as, and I, I said in the book, even give the movie away. For free, right, right. Because it's all about driving people to. I don't care about three ninety nine for a rental or nine ninety nine for you to buy the movie. I care you to to, to buy the summit. That's going to be a hundred dollars, yes. or it'll be a couple hundred bucks, or you or my services, or my consulting, or my books, or my other things that have bigger, bigger, um, you know, um, interest in, uh, you know, financial interest in, as opposed to the movie that I might have a distribution deal that I don't, as we talked about, might not get all the money because of expenses and all that stuff but they don't take money away from summits. They don't take money away from books. They don't take money away from services or other things that you can provide. It's fascinating. And that you leveraged the people inside of the movies, audiences by making them partners with an affiliate program Yes, is the future. It, it, it's, I mean, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't they, if they like the product, they'll, they'll push it out for them. It's not that hard. And they just make, they make money and they help their audience. Yeah. So it is a win-win. It's a wonderful ecosystem. It truly is a wonderful ecosystem. Especially, and there's a podcast. Especially in a niche. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's a podcast a niche where There's a podcast now. We did 38 episodes of the podcast. We did three summits and, you know, and internationally, like we pushed that summit out in Germany and France and it's still Spain. going. You can still go. And we have great partners over there we work with. And, um, and yeah, and a podcast, what else did we do? <laughs> the podcast so, we've, we've, we have 38 episodes. We're going to start up again probably in July. We've taken yeah. a little pause and now we're developing a series and going to and to go out with a series hopefully. Of course, like a like a like a like a 10 episode series or eight episodes. Yeah, series. like a 10 episode like a premium doc series. That's that's always been kind of in the back of our minds. It's just been again like timing and we think like now is is a good time. <sighs> I'm just saying, guys, this is, I mean, it's everything I've been saying <laughs> for years. It's its so brilliant. You, I, if I would be writing the book right now, you'd be a case study. And maybe in the second <laughs> edition, I'll put you guys in as a case study because sure. it's just, sure. it's so brilliantly done. But this is the future for independent filmmakers. And and you've done, I mean, you've been down the road so much already. You know, you've done mm -hmm. a, ton, a ton of work. You know how hard it is to sell a movie and yeah. how to make it to make money with a movie. Yeah. And the future is, I, I, I keep saying this, you have to be that entrepreneurial filmmaker that takes control, creates other products, creates other services, creates other revenue streams off of the film you're doing. And you can't do it with a narrative. I've seen it. I have many examples of it. But Doc seems to be so much easier because the audience is right. Like they just want it. It's a different audience. Yeah. That, that, mean, that makes sense. It, I, the audience, the niche, and, and also usually the passion behind a doc, uh, somebody that's doing it has some expertise in that topic or passion. And I mean, you got to have that, right? If you're going to stick with something and make it big and brand, like you have to be into cycling if you're going to do a cycling movie or right. road, to, road to Dharma, like motorcycling in the Himalayas. I'm into yogic thought. I'm into freedom. Freedom is important to me and wisdom is important. I can't write a course on freedom to go along with the if I'm not into that, you know, right, you're like this yogi's out of his mind. He's trying to kill me. Like if you wouldn't have been in the vibe with yeah. the story, you can't. So you has to be something that's true to you as a filmmaker I think so. I think or that interests you as a filmmaker, because you're going to be with this for a while, <laughs> for, for a while. You know, we can't Americanize everything. And be like, Hey, let's market the hell. If you don't have any passion for it, absolutely won't, won't happen or won't work. Uh, like, I'm looking at some other films. I'm like, like the polygon that it, we did, like there's not much we could have. I mean, that's about nuclear testing in Kazakhstan. And like, it's, it's very small niche. Very small <laughs> niche. Like, no, <laughs> but it's still a, a, a film you need to get up. Women of the White Buffalo, we just released Tuesday, right. which is about Native American women and the history of Native Americans and, um, and really the wisdom of the, the matriarch that's coming through. Now, could there be some other ancillary products or maybe a summit? Yeah, maybe. But the main push is like, let's just get some awareness of this thing going. But Deborah, who directed it, she's been working her butt off for years. And her ancillary thing, to be honest, is photographs because she's a photographer. She has some amazing photographs of this that she sells for, you know, big pieces and big money. So, you know, that's her passion. That's what she's good at. That's what she's going to do along with the film. Uh, yeah. And 
and I imagine that uh, the, with that, if I was going to ask you about that film, because I know it just came out this week, um, mm-hmm. Women of the White Buffalo, that is, you know, if, uh, talking on a market research a audience base, there is an audience for this film, yes. uh, Native, Native Americans. Yes. Many Native American, Americans around the country would be very interested in, probably some in, in, in overseas, you know, people who are interested in, in this, some, but this is your, this is your market. So could you do a summit with interviewing, uh, showing the full interviews? Absolutely. You know, is it as big of an audience as heel? Probably not, No. but it's still an audience and it's bigger than nuclear testing. In- Correct. <laughs> in- 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 it's like, Correct. That, that's yeah. a, that's a passion project. That's like, I want to get this, uh, get this out there and that's fine too. But, when you make a movie like Heal or other projects, they give you the freedom to do whatever you want. So if you want to make a small little movie that's really just about getting it out there for people and doing the best, that's fine too. You see, every everyone always filmmakers, I always find to think that like you got to make a hundred million dollars to be a success. No, no, not at all. It's most most movies, most filmmakers, ninety nine point nine percent of filmmakers don't make a hundred million dollars. Right. You know, I always tell right. people if you made a movie for fifty thousand dollars and you made a hundred thousand dollars, man, you are a success. Yeah. You know, and if you yeah. happen to make quarter million dollars, fantastic. Now you can go finance another movie, live for a little while while you keep going forward and yeah. doing it. And and redefine success a little. Now we all have to, as you, you interviewed Anand, Anand's in both worlds, right? He studied economics at the university and he's a, a guru, right? Yeah. Uh, he studied with masters in the Himalayas, both. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to be able to survive. You can't deny the fact that we need money and we need, we're in the society and we need to play in the society. It's not time to go in the caves. Uh, but but at the same time, we want to do something that's meaningful. So, right. you know, we want to do something like if we can redefine success, meaning, okay, yes, we have to be able to support ourselves, but could see, uh, how about a teacher that had a few students like learn and grow out of their shell that year? And like, what a success. They had a few kids really get something from that teacher and go on and it really inspired their lives. Okay. Right. A few people watch Women of the White Buffalo or, or watch Road to Dharma. A lot of people watch Road to Dharma or do the course and they're like, I'm going to India, man. And it's like, cool. Now, did it, has it reached 3 million people? No, but like 1,500 people have taken the course and, you know, have 100 or 200 of those said, I'm going to India now. Sweet. Like, I might have changed somebody's life. And that's successful. Like, I got to share my story and, and push somebody else to do the same. But to me, it's like, okay, success. Exactly. So, you, and you have to define success for yourself. And I know for a long time, I defined success of, you know, I have to be the biggest director in the world to, yeah. to define success. And I was very angry for such a long time about that and very uh, depressed. And I think a lot of filmmakers and screenwriters and actors, so. all of them go through the same process because they all like, we all got to be Spielberg or Nolan or Fincher or James Cameron. And like, dude, there's only, there's only one of those. And they're anomalies. They are masters. They are. Yeah. It's just a recipe a whole... for psychosis. It's a recipe for sadness and pain. Exactly. So I, when I started the show seven years ago, I started to redefine what success was to me. I'm like, Oh, nice. I get to do what I do every day. I get to talk to people like yourself and share this information and help other people and be of service to my community. And I'm like, that right. makes, that makes me happy. And I'm like, and then I can go off and make my little movies when I want to go make them with not really caring if they make a tremendous amount of money, though they all have been very profitable and they all have done well. That's not my concern per se. You know, it's not awesome. like I, I need to make money on this film in order to eat. No, I've built another inf- infrastructure that allows me to go off and do whatever I want. That's or, or for your identity, like your identity is not so wrapped in it. It's right? not anymore. Absolutely that's, not. Yeah, that's it's beautiful. That's beautiful. It's, so that's what I try to teach here at the sh- on the show and try to really have people understand what success is for them and really define it for themselves. Because if not, you will you will go mad. And you will absolutely go, man, this business is tough enough. <laughs> it's just, it's brutal enough without, without you having to, to like, Oh God, I'm 23. I didn't make uh, citizen Kane yet. Like Orson Welles. Oh, I'm 27. I haven't made jaws yet. Like Spielberg. I'm like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> yeah. I stopped, I stopped watching, reading a lot of the trades or, or, you know, it's not like I don't read them, but, and, and, watching a lot of award shows because it's like it, it can't be 
the focus it can't be like i have to you know it has to be like no how do we define it for ourselves as success and how do we have this internal dial of gratitude and what we're doing in our life and you know america tries to really throw other ideas down your throat i mean that's part of, i think why why we're both here alex is because mm-hmm. we're changing that culture in some ways of saying let's give meaning in a different way to our lives and to media and maybe not keep throwing the same stories of success down people's throat like once you get this and the girl and that then you're happy no you know uh it sounds cliche now but it's really still out there you know and it's really still a, I, a story motif all the time I mean, because like I tell people all the time, Hollywood is fantastic about selling the sizzle, but they suck at selling the steak. And that's what that's all about. And I always and I've said this a ton of times on the show. So everyone, please forgive me, but I'll say it again because Adam hasn't heard this. (laughs) The greatest analogy for Hollywood is going down to Hollywood Boulevard. And I don't know if you've been down to Hollywood Boulevard. I'm sure you have. It is a cesspool. But on Oscar night, it looks like oh my God, it's Hollywood glitz and glamour and look at the staircase and look at this and look at the stars. But the second the the award show is over, they take up the red carpet and the drug needles are still down in the alley. So it's just, but that is the perfect analogy of what Hollywood is because they show something, but what's really going on behind the scenes is probably not what they're showing. And that's what they've built, that that they've done since they started the industry. So, but people get caught up in that in that mentality of sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. And I need this, 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 and this, and I'll be happy when this happens. You can't be happy when this happens because life is not a destination. It is a journey. And I've talked to Oscar winners and I've talked to Emmy winners and I've talked to very successful people who've reached the top of that quote unquote mountaintop. And then they go, now what? And a lot of them get depressed because they've been working all their life for this Oscar and they get the Oscar and they're like, I don't know what to do now. Like, where do I go from here? Because they haven't enjoyed the journey up to the top highest pass. They were just <laughs> focusing the highest pass. And then when they right. get there, just like, I don't, right. I don't understand exactly. what I do. It's- that's why I did that movie first. I, that's why, you know. <laughs> oh, I see. It's the journey. Okay. It's cool. the journey. See, it's, it's all part of the plan. It was all part of the plan the entire time, I'm sure. <laughs> No, Adam, I'm going I'm to do the I'm going to do the hardest question, you know, hardest film I could possibly do first that would teach me everything so that I can then have a sane career uh, right. in filmmaking. Because I'm, I'm assuming heel not so difficult <laughs> comparatively. Not, not compa- <laughs> no, comparatively. No, you know, uh, no, not a, no life threatening moments. Right. You know, you just you know, we go to a house, we go to you know, sit down, set yeah. some lights up, we shoot some stuff. But, but, but I'll tell you, you know, the adventure is like, oh, what's the adventure? Oh. The people that are going through the healing are, yes, they're the yes. ones, you know, I, not me as a filmmaker, but oh, we're watching them. And like, it is everything when you're sick, it's everything. Oh, uh, so it does, okay. you know, as much as I love adventure, it has a little bit of that in the film, but no, for me as a filmmaker, not as, not as crazy road to Dharma. Yeah. I'm still at risk again, even though I know how to ride a motorcycle. And you know, and this is the insanity of filmmakers. Uh, you're still thinking about trying to do a second, third season one day of road of to course. Dharma because you're insane. We all are. <laughs> because normal human of beings course. wouldn't do that twice, film it right. twice, and then go, you know, I think I could do this two or three more times. <laughs> I was just in India with Anand, right? And I right. was like, well, are you open to, because it always starts from, are you open to letting us walk, uh, film? Because he's going to do this no matter what with people. It's authentic. It's not for the show. Can I come along and film the next one? And he said, yes. So we're, you know, we're talking when in 2023, uh, we can do it again. And then I have the filmmaker crazy mind. It's like, like I said earlier, you know, once we've done season two and three, then Netflix will wake up and go, okay, we'll take all three. That's still the little psychosis. Delusion. This is the delusion. (laughs) Of filmmakers, we're absolutely yeah. delusional yeah. because it, but, and look, it's so funny that you've st- <laughs> like you're not a newbie at this, dude. This is like I hear that kind of talk from like someone who's just like, you know, I'm just gonna do this and this, and then Hollywood will notice me or Netflix will notice me. Right. You still have that mentality even absolutely. after over a decade in, just like you know, yep. I think if I do three or more, four more seasons, I think Netflix will finally take notice. I think so. <laughs> and I do believe it. I and I absolutely in my heart believe it because, like, oh no, the <laughs> spiritual audience is growing and it, it'll have. And if not, you know, so what? It, it got me to go keep doing it. And, absolutely. And you know, I just love I it's like it's my baby. Rhoda Dharma is my I just oh, love, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I, I, I tell everybody to just see it. it. 
Yeah, I'll know. Doing it. Of course. And something it. else will pay the bills. You know, something else will pay. And I'll just keep doing that because I love We're it. carnies. Da- we're carnies. Da- <laughs> we're all we are is carnies and we just are insane. We're we're so we're circus folk. We're so we're circus folk. That's basically what we are. I, I've, I've said that so many times. It's so true. We are circus folk. We put up a tent, we put on a show and then we leave the town and we go on to the next town. It's the same thing. If a film sets the exact same thing and the, and the people on the crew very entertaining people. <laughs> very, entertaining. <laughs> very entertaining. Very unique people that you meet along along your journey. Uh, but it is a be- I call it the beautiful sickness. Uh, that's what it is being a filmmaker, being a creative. It is a beautiful sickness because it's a sickness you can't get rid of. You can't. It's so fun. It's so, <laughs> but, yeah, to want to teach, you know, it's to want to teach and share and maybe there's you, a psychosis. A, yeah. For yeah, you as a documentary. A little, as a documentary, yeah. There's a, you know, I notice a little bit in me that's, that um, like my own subconscious that wants to be heard, you know, that maybe I wasn't heard enough as a kid. Okay. okay I, I see that part and let's not operate from that part. Uh, and then the other part is like the natural teacher. I've taught soccer forever. And, you know, the natural teacher that has found a format to do that, you know, right. that is called film and entertainment and adventure. And I get to hopefully share in that way too. And I, and I don't stop teaching. Like I teach yoga on the beach to my friends and stuff. So like, yeah, that's a that's stretch. It's all about stretching, though, really. You know, <laughs> stretching. <it's all. laughs> and, and like, you know, I, I often remind myself in terms of life skills, like if I had the Oscar and a million dollars, would I still be here at the beach doing yoga with my friend? Absolutely. Would I still be eating here? Absolutely. Will I still be, you know, like, would you, would you go much- back on the road? To Dharma. Of, of yes. course. Yes. <laughs> I would I would still be doing everything I'm doing. So like I better not wait to be happy because it's gonna be the same, actually. There's just gonna be a you know, maybe a couple more projects going or more money or blah blah. And so you just you have to kind of wipe away the BS in the mind. You have to. Absolutely not. And listen, uh, I'm gonna ask you a few questions, ask all sure. my guests. Sure. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? I don't because <laughs> I don't see it as a breaking into the business it's larceny it's larceny it's larceny sir it's larceny (laughs) (laughs) this business is larceny we have to break our way in (laughs) or make it or make it (laughs) i just here's what i did when i first got to la and this might work for people and might not i i went to things and did things that i like to do so that i made friends with people that i liked so that i didn't network for the sake of networking so that the people i'm close with i'm actually close with and they're had a core and still do now have a core group of people that I actually trust. Um, and, and maybe it's a little different because it's the doc world and consciousness world, but the consciousness world can be as crazy as Hollywood, you know? I mean, the, 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 your first movie, uh, I need, I need full credit as a director. <laughs> right. Exa- Done. Exactly. Done. And there's plenty of stuff. And so maybe that's my advice is to be yourself in the, in the lifestyle way. And then that way you, you have a core group of people support system as you're going through hard things that you actually call friends. Um, And that way you're not pushing so hard to network, you know, and if you're going to something like an event, it's something you might actually connect with someone with, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that's my only bit of advice because the way I did is so strange and absurd that it's not going to, yeah, go to India, find a guru, and make a movie. Like, that's eh, not gonna work. It's yeah, been, yeah, that's done. been done. Been done. <laughs> it's been done already. It's been done. Um, now, now it's totally cliche. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Um, it, yeah, let's let's talk about recent. Then, what's been <laughs> going on in my in my head is is that you know these this propensity for us to look back at a conversation and want to redo it, right? Doubt, we'll call that doubt, um, to change the way, what I said, what I did, um, or the, the thoughts that project in the future, I'm going to do this and that still, even my last time in India was just looking at where that's all coming from. And I decided just to re-engineer all that. So that lesson was, if I'm engineering the future or engineering what I should have said in the past, what needs to be re-engineered is right now. So let's flip the engineering on now and, and say, okay, well, what is it I'm feeling that's making me have those thoughts? Oh, I'm feeling some lack or something. In my So let's use that engineering mind of redoing future or past and look and engineer that feeling and say, what's going on in there? And can I shift my perspective to, to break it open now rather than this false story making of the past and future? And 
of course, I've known that through awareness and meditation for years, but to really use the wording of engineering and just say, I'm going to engineer the moment and look deeply at the feeling when those thoughts come up, it's just really hitting hard right now. And I think that's super, super helpful to not get lost in our minds. And three of your favorite films of all time. Yeah, I saw that you asked this, and I have two at least that I logged in. Uh, Life is beautiful because I just beautiful. Uh, because beautiful. that ability to help someone else, right, and that to bring us out of our own suffering in some ways really it, it can speak to us all. When you heal other people or help other people, it does lift you up. Mm-hmm. Um, the Princess Bride because it got uh, me yeah. through college, you know, just memorizing the... the, the my name is Vandia Montoya. I my father. <laughs> prepared right. to die. <laughs> uh, and then my third, I hadn't figured it out. So let's just uh, see what comes into my consciousness right now. What? Yeah, okay, well, I guess Star Wars would have to be in there because it pushed me to want a Yoda in my life. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, Anand, my guru. I think... Mm-hmm. We all growing up want it. I think I even say that in the highest past. Like, we all yeah, want to do it. We all, yeah, every, look, Yoda. I mean, I, you're Yoda. speaking to, I have a life size Yoda right there. He was in my <laughs> show. I have life size Yoda right there. I have a little Yoda right here. Oh my God. Um, awesome. So I have a baby Yoda right here. <laughs> A bobblehead. If, if people are, you know, just I have a bobblehead, a bobblehead baby Yoda over there, um, and a full size baby Yoda above me. So I, uh, I'm a Yoda fan. But you're right. We all want someone wise to guide us through this insanity that we call life, because it is. We're all trying to figure it out from the moment we come out and we're slapped in the butt and we start crying. You know, we're just like trying to figure this out and having someone who can answer questions for you, someone who's maybe been, uh, understands things that you don't understand at maybe a much deeper level that you don't understand is something I think we all long for in one way, shape or form, whether that be your parents, whether that be a guru, whether that be a, you know, a friend, uh, whoever, we're all looking for that in one way, shape or form. And some of us have the ability to do it ourselves, to be our own internal gurus uh, and learn just by life. And life is the guru that teaches you, unfortunately, for better and worse sometimes. But right. um, but listen, Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to to talk to my audience, man. I I truly appreciate it. And I I recommend everybody watch all of your films, even Polygon. (laughs) (laughs) It's not as depressing as it sounds, but it needs to be seen. No, thank, thank you, man. Thank for this podcast, for having a non non sharing the the soul that you're sharing on the next level soul. Yeah, I appreciate and that, man. Just sharing your heart on this podcast is good. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, it's such a cool journey, and the next one I'm working on, I can't talk about this doc, but it has a built in audience. Nice. And, it, and of course, I'm giving it a consciousness and a meaning to it. So, like, you know, we're we're starting to find how to do this, how to sneak in the good messages into something that's commercially viable. And I'm excited to talk about that once it comes out. But again, thank you so much. This is awesome. Thank you, my friend.